Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Los Angeles Homebuyer Workshop, more, more so probably our Southern California Homebuyer Workshop. My name is Jason Maida. It's great to be with all of you this evening. Um, we're going to get started into tonight's content and, um, you know, just kind of uh, housekeeping for tonight. Um, we really try to encourage questions as we move through tonight's content. Um, and so as we as we go, go through the different topics, feel free to use the Q&A function on Zoom, and then we'll answer some of those questions on air with our audience. Um, and then uh, just as a heads up, all the material that we share with you this evening, we're going to go ahead and email that out to you tomorrow. Really encourage you to take uh, really great notes um, as we're going through tonight's content, but we'll also send you some follow-up information tomorrow via email. Okay, so um, just to, as we get kind of launched, just a quick little bit about me. So I'm the branch manager of American Pacific Mortgage here in Sacramento. We service all of, all of California here from our office. And uh, we specialize in obviously in educating buyers to, to go into the home buying process. But we're really focused on uh, first time home buyers and what the needs and support they that they require, such as different assistance programs, which you're going to learn a little bit about this evening. So uh, a lot of good information. And, and by the way, these, these workshops we teach every couple weeks on Zoom. Um, this one's going to be focused on the Southern California markets, but we do uh, workshops for uh, our Northern California markets, as well as some of our other states that we service here from our office. Um, here's what uh, tonight's talking points look like. We're going to go over the housing market. We're going to go through a quick little buy versus rent analysis. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about credit, how to improve our credit, get us in the best possible position for our home buying uh, we're going to take a look at student loans and how those can impact your qualifying. We'll also look at loan programs, some of the income documents that are required for qualifying, as well as some of the assets and maybe some savings goals that we need for our home purchase. We're going to look at uh, some of the assistance programs that are available. Uh, Cal HFA, which is one of our partners uh, in first-time homebuyer programs, just announced a really cool program called the Equity Builder Program. Many of you might have even already heard about that. We'll talk about some of the um, requirements for that and how that might be able to help. We'll also wrap up or we'll also go into kind of the loan process this evening. We'll go through our six steps of home buying, what it looks like to be pre-approved for your home purchase, all the way to getting your keys for your home. And finally, we'll talk a little bit about a consultation. And that's where we get a chance to put together a home buying game plan for you. So when we think about home buying, there's a lot of great benefits that come with owning a home. Um, you know, for those of you that are currently renting and, you know, maybe working with your landlord on, landlord on you know, renewals of lease and stuff like that and worrying about your lease uh, payments increasing, the benefits of having a home is obviously being able to have stability in your housing payments. So being have more predictability about what your budget looks like. Um, this is an asset. So you can have the ability to be able to pass along that asset to um, heirs of your state. Uh, growth of equity through, well, growth of wealth through home equity. Um, home equity is the difference of what you owe on a house versus what the market value is. And finally, there's a lot of great tax benefits that still come with owning a home. Potentially, you could still deduct the interest that um, that you have on your mortgage. Now, when we're doing some budgeting and kind of figuring out what home buying could look for us look like for us, I, I really uh, encourage our buyers to look um, and do some side by side comparison with budgeting. And um, we're going to kind of jump into a rent versus buying calculator where we can kind of do a quick little analysis um, to see what it could look like if we continue to pay rent versus what it could look like with buying. And, and by the way, for everyone, um, it's not it's not going to maybe buying doesn't make sense for everyone, I should say, um, because maybe where you're at from a housing perspective or what your savings looks like or maybe credit. But you know, our goal in today's workshop is to give you the tools and resources so you know what options you have available to you for you know be, be able to reach home ownership if, if that's one of your financial goals. So let's take a look at this, this rent versus buying calculator. And I'm going to kind of do a, like a little bit of a what if scenario. And in case for those of you that maybe started joining us late, I'm going to send out all the material of tonight's class out tomorrow. So Ken Fleck on our team will send that out to you. And then so you'll have all these tools available to you, including all the various links that we'll go through. So let's let's assume that we're paying rent. I'm going to put about $2,500 a month. With renting, we're going to have renter's insurance. So we'll add that. Um, the cost of rent, that varies based upon where you're renting. But let's just say 3% is our rent increase. Uh, we're going to assume a, a home purchase of, let's see in this example, we're going to use $600,000. Um, depending on where we want to buy in Southern California, um, you know, that that price will vary accordingly, whether that's a condo, a townhouse, maybe a single family home. Um, and then minimum down payment, I'm going to go ahead and put in 3% because technically 3% is the minimum for that level. Um, and then estimated property taxes at 7250 
Um, we're gonna put in homeowner's insurance estimates at about $1,200, and then our maintenance costs of about $2,000. Now, the reason why we wanna factor that in is because um, when owning a home, it's not like we can just contact our landlord anymore to fix our hot water that's gone out. We're gonna have to carve out that within our own monthly budget. Um, and then let's take a look at loan information. So we're gonna assume a 30-year fixed mortgage. By, by the way, most of what we're gonna talk about is 30-year fixed products. Um, origination charges will be part of your closing costs. Um, and an origination charge is what your lender will charge. Generally, we have a 995 uh, underwriting fee as well as a $910 processing fee. However, if you're joining us um, through one of our partnerships, like I know we have many uh, USC alum joining us this evening, um, we discount the processing fee from $910 down to $160. This next section is called discount points. Discount points are costs that you can pay to help lower the cost of your interest rate. Usually one point or 1% of your loan um, will lower the, the rate of your mortgage a quarter percent. So that's an option that some uh, buyers will take advantage of, especially in this kind of rising rate environment that we're in today. And then other settlement charges will be things like title, escrow, transfer taxes, recording costs for the county. We're gonna, we're gonna put in a line item of $12,000 for those costs. Now, closing costs for buying a house, we generally estimate around two to 3% of your purchase price. So when you're looking at some of your savings goals for home purchasing, we not only need to set aside our down payment, but um, funds for closing costs. And like I said, those are like two to 3%. Um, the final um, tab we wanna open up here is our other assumptions. So we're gonna assume our new house, if we purchase, is gonna appreciate roughly about 3%. You're gonna learn a little bit about you know, the market and what we've seen within the housing market over the last, um, last few months. But ultimately, we're gonna project about 3% for appreciation. We're gonna say we're gonna be in this new house for about seven years. The cost of selling the house at the end of seven years, 8% of the purchase price or the selling price. <clears throat> and that includes the cost of for your realtors, both the buyer's agent, as well as the listing agent who represents the seller and any miscellaneous closing costs. Now, it's important to know that as you're going on this journey towards home ownership, um, when you utilize the services of a realtor, you're not responsible for that commission that is paid for by the seller. So right now, the, as first-time buyers, we don't have to worry about that commission, but ultimately down the road, once we sell, we could potentially have to pay that. And then we're gonna add state and federal taxes uh, and then a savings rate of 1%. So what this comparison does is says, okay, well, if I'm going to continue to pay rent of about $2,500 a month versus what my new mortgage payment is going to be, and by the way, it's a lot more expensive. It's about $2,200 more a month of $4,700 um, in principal and interest, taxes and insurance, and projected mortgage insurance. Now, while that housing payment is going to be more expensive and increasing my budget by $2,200, my opportunity uh, of buying um, over the next seven years instead of continuing to rent is about $33,000. Now, not all of us are gonna run out and buy a $600,000 house. Maybe it's a three or $400,000 house. Everybody's budget looks a little bit different, but this gives you a little bit of a guideline of what buying could look like for you. Because oftentimes when we talk with clients, you know, they wanna draw maybe an apples to apples comparison and say, if I'm paying 2,500 in rent, I only can pay 2,500 in mortgage, but we gotta really factor in all the benefits like home appreciation, tax savings, um, because we're creating wealth potentially through home buying. So um, so this total cost analysis says that, you know, the total cost of renting over seven years, is gonna be 200, over $200,000. My mortgage payment after I deduct, um, or not mortgage payment, but my total cost after including depreciation and tax savings would be at 189,000. So that's how we arrive at the 33,000 figure, okay? Now I'd encourage all of our, our students tonight, you know, get, do, you know, if you get a chance, try to go ahead and do your own calculation um, to see what that would look like. You can plug in your own rent situation versus what it could be look like in terms of uh, a potential mortgage payment. Certainly as part of a consultation, we can help walk you through that as well. Okay, so I mentioned we talked a little bit about the housing market and uh, certainly you know, the, the state of today's market is impacting purchasing power for a lot of our first time home buyers. Um, and this slide kind of shows you what we've seen across um, the, the LA markets. And um, when we look at the trajectory of the housing market right now, and I'm, I kind of want to look more closely at the last like two years, because this gray line here represents 
the start of the pandemic. And as you can see, the trajectory of the housing market was pretty significant, right? It went, we had a nice little move upwards. Um, what led to that? Well, a few things. One is we had um, historically low interest rates, rates touched as low as 2.625. Um, we had, uh, and we still do have challenges with inventory. So that low interest rate environment created huge demand, um, but limited supply, which uh, pushed um, home prices up. And then as we all have seen, um, maybe even for our own personal experiences, our work environment has changed, right? More remote, uh, remote work is going on. So, you know, as you know, future buyers are looking at purchasing. They're saying, well, hey, you know, maybe I don't have to make the hour and a half commute to downtown LA. Maybe I can live out in Riverside or San Bernardino or whatever the case may be. And now I can be able to do my work from there. And that might, you know, uh, allow me to be able to purchase in one of those markets. And so a lot of that demand, um, you know, pushed the housing prices up. And unfortunately, we just didn't have the housing inventory to support it, whether that's new homes or resale homes. And that's why you see this pretty swift move in the trajectory of the housing market. Now, you can notice there's a little bit of a curve here happening, and that's that's showing that we're seeing a little bit of changes in the housing market. Homes are staying on the market a little bit longer than they were, say, this same time last year. Um, and then, you know, we're seeing that some sellers are having to do price cuts, so they've come out a little bit aggressive with their pricing. Now they're having to draw back a little bit. The interest rate environment is leading a little bit to that as well, so we're still having the same inventory challenges. But with interest rates rising, affecting buyer buyer qualifying and or maybe pushing some buyers onto the sidelines, um, that has changed kind of the dynamic of the market. So I think in some areas, let's just look at California specifically, I think we're seeing a little bit of softening, um, which is really good for our first time home buyers. You know, when working in some of the barrier uh, markets up in San Francisco and Oakland, San Jose, as well as LA and Orange County, you know, those are challenging markets for some of our first time buyers to enter. And so with this softening, I think that there presents a really good opportunity for our future buyers. So part of this, the equation is going to be where the housing market's at. But the other thing is where interest rates are at. And as we look at interest rates over the last like two, three months, we've seen them uptick over 2% from what we saw same time last year. And so that is changing a bit of the purchasing power for some of our clients. Um, as you can see in this slide, this, this side over here represents the interest rates over the last five years. Um, we saw our 2.625 low right around the end of 2020. Um, and then we saw a little bit of movement in 2021, rates touched over about 3.5. And then entering 2022, we stayed in that three and a half range. But then as you can see here, once we got into uh, the end of Q1, interest rates just really vaulted super high. And average interest rate is, is somewhere around five and a quarter to five and a half percent right now. So, um, you know, it, you know, when we're looking at buying power um, and, you know, qualifying for our buyers, you know, interest rates going to play a big role in, in what that what that will look like. Now, the question we always get is, you know, where are interest rates going? Um, and that's just really an unknown right now. Um, as many of you have seen and maybe felt the impact of inflation, that's driving a lot of the behaviors with interest rates. You know, we're trying to find some leveling where we can see interest rates kind of stabilize a little bit. Um, over the last week or so, we have seen interest rates kind of flatten a little bit. So hopefully that's an encouraging sign because obviously we don't want to be reaching interest rates in the 6% range because that's only going to just diminish our ability to be able to purchase at a certain level that we're looking for. So, um, you know, these, these things happen with interest rates. You know, we do go through cycles in the real estate industry. Um, and so we'll have to see how this kind of, how this plays out. Now, ultimately, uh, or not ultimately, but as part of a, a rising rate environment like this, especially in our high cost of living uh, areas, we do see more attention around adjustable rate mortgages. And I will say for first time buyers, that's not really something I would really um, advocate for because adjustable rate mortgages adjust at the end of a certain time period. Now you can see there's a, there's a slight difference between the, the adjustable rate rate floating around 4% versus the five and a quarter or five and a half percent at 30 year fix. But the trade-off is, you know, you're only going to have that low rate for an introductory period of time. So that's something we really want to kind of, um, you know, uh, kind of do the analysis to see if that makes sense for us. Okay. Um, I want to kind of jump back a little bit. We had a question that came in from our audience asking if do we see any foresee any dip in the housing market anytime soon. Um, I wish I could, uh, you know, have a crystal ball on that. We, we just don't know. But I think to my point earlier is I see a little bit of a softening. Um, 
And, you know, what, what leads me to, to believe that uh, we're having a softening is because when, as we're seeing appraisals come in for properties that we currently are helping clients with, so they're in escrow, which you're going to learn about the process in just a bit. Sometimes the appraisal values that are coming in are not necessarily supporting the purchase prices. Um, some of that's just attributed to like super buyer competitiveness. We're trying to get that accepted offer from a seller and then pushing it into bidding wars that are moving the purchase price up but then not having the data to support that price level um, in terms of like closed transactions. But some of it is also just because of changes in the market. So I think to answer your question, I think we're going to have to see what happens, um, you know, especially, at, you know, if interest rates don't slow down and we continue to see those bubble up. Um, that might put some pressure on the housing market. OK, let's talk a little bit more about interest rates and kind of what how interest rates are calculated for our buyers, because it's not a one size fits all with interest rates. Interest rates are based upon your credit score. So credit eligibility, the type of program that you're going to utilize, how much you finance, um, what your down payment might look like. So if I'm going to put three percent down versus maybe a 20 percent down payment that can influence my interest rate offering. Um, and I talked a little bit about this earlier, which is cost uh, to buy down your interest rate, also known as discount points. So you can pay additional funds to help lower down the cost of it, your interest rate. Uh, in case you missed it earlier, a discount point is generally equal to 1% of your loan amount, which will generally equate to a quarter percent reduction in interest rate. The reason I use generally because there's pricing models and they don't always kind of even out to one, one point equaling a quarter percent reduction or rate, just depends on how the market is sized up. And finally, uh, term can influence your interest rate offering. So the lower term you have, so if you went from a 30 year fixed to a 15 year fixed mortgage, that could potentially lower your interest rate. And as part of a kind of our comprehensive consultation that we do with you, we'll kind of figure out what interest rate is the best fit for you based upon the program selection and you know how much you wanna put down. So that's a really important part of designing a home buying plan for you. As we learned about interest rates just a second ago, now credit is gonna play a role in interest rates. Not only does it play a role in interest rate, but also plays a role in program offering, as well as a thing called mortgage insurance, which you're gonna learn a little bit about in just a few minutes. And each program has various credit score minimums. So for an FHA loan, the minimum score is 580, conventional is 620, VA is a 620, so that's for our veterans that have served. And then the CalHFA products uh, that you're gonna learn a little bit more about this evening, goes from anywhere between a 640 to a 680 credit score minimum. Um, when we look at the score weighting, um, this is what it looks like. So 15% is gonna be how long I've had credit. 20% is gonna be how much new credit do I have in use? So have I opened up a new account that could negatively impact my score. But we also look at inquiries, uh, hard inquiries specifically um, could impact your credit score. Now. Many of you probably know the rule around hard inquiries. You do have a 30-day window of time when you're shopping for mortgages as well as auto loans to apply with as many lenders as you want. And it's the equivalent of one in credit, credit inquiry hit to your score. Um, so that's that's a rule that's in place to be able to allow you to shop as a consumer. Um, now, in starting our process, we start with a soft inquiry, which doesn't impact your credit score, but allows us to design financing options for you. Um, 30% is going to be how much I owe in revolving credit balances versus credit limits. Um, and that's also known as credit utilization. Um, one way of kind of managing credit utilization, we always recommend try to at least get your credit balances below 50% of your credit limit. Ideally, or to optimize your credit score, try to keep those below 10% of the credit limit amount. So um, that's what we encourage our clients to do if you're really trying to improve that credit score. One tip I'd, I'd share with you in round credit and how you manage your credit balances or revolving credit balances is to check out your billing cycle date on every one of your credit cards. So on a credit card, you have a billing cycle date and you have a due date. If my billing cycle date's on the 20th, but my due date's on say the fourth of the month, the 20th will be the date in which the credit card issuer, so let's say American Express, is going to send out the data of your balance, payment history, monthly payment out to the credit agencies. Is If you can manage to pay off or pay down that credit balance before the 20th, that's the balance that will get reported out to the credit bureaus. So, you know, that's a great way of trying to low or trying to increase your credit score by lowering your credit balances. Oftentimes clients will come to us for consultations and we'll review their credit and they'll say, well, hey, I pay that bill off every month or that bill is just higher than it usually is. The reason why is because the credit issuer has already sent the data out to the bureaus. And so that's what's coming up 
when we pull the credit report. So that's a way that you can manage your utilization. The final component is payment history. That's probably the easiest one. The better on-time payment history we have, the better our credit score is going to be. If we've had past challenges, like maybe a 30-day late or a 60-day late, if it's in the most recent 12 to 24 month period, that's gonna be the most impactful to your credit score. Um, days of delinquency are measured in 30 plus delinquencies, 30 days plus delinquency, 60 days, and then 90 plus. There's also other severe uh, ratings like charge offs where the lender has taken off a, a loss on the account or maybe a collection account, which we're gonna learn a little bit more about past, uh, past two accounts and how those impact your score in just a bit. Now, many of you have access to things like Credit Karma or Experian, TransUnion, maybe at Equifax to be able to manage your credit score, and that's great. The one thing I will tell you, when you look at those monitoring systems, they're using a credit card score. So it's not gonna necessarily match up to what we pull with a mortgage score. There's actually three different models. There's the mortgage, auto, and then the credit card model, which I mentioned, you know, organizations like Credit Karma use. Um, things like account a closure can potentially impact your credit score. So if you're in the habit of maybe doing balance transfers because of really good benefits on a credit card and you close out a previous credit card, just be careful with that because that can actually negatively impact your credit score. And when we look at evaluating um, eligibility for our, our buyers, we always look at the middle credit score. Um, and here's what that would look like. If I have a 700 score on Equifax, um, 680 on TransUnion, and a 660 on Experian, we're gonna use the middle credit score for qualifying. So in this case, it would be 680 for, for our eligibility for our program. Now, if I'm applying with a partner and my partner has, let's say a 660, 640 and 620 score, well, my partner has the lower middle score. So that's what we'd use for qualifying. Um, now, one of our things as part of going through our consultation is kind of doing a credit analysis and trying to make sure that you have all the right tools and resources to optimize your credit score. In doing that, though, we are going to look at the middle credit score when that time comes when we have to do the hard inquiry. Here's how long negative items are going to remain on your credit report. So credit inquiries are two years or less. Uh, things like late payments, maybe collections, uh, those will all be on your credit report for seven years or less. And then federal records like bankruptcies, um, Chapter 7 or 13 will be on your uh, credit report 10 years or less. And then federal student loans um, can be on your or federal student loans or any type of federal delinquent debt um, can be on your credit report indefinitely. Um, now, I think this is in place right now. I um, shared it with previous workshops. There's a new credit rule out for the credit report, credit report agencies, and that has to do with medical collections. So if you have a medical collection, no longer will that report to your credit bureaus. Um, so that won't, be, that won't impact your credit score. Okay, let me just make sure we're good on questions. Hold on. Do I need to repeat on credit credit scores? Did, so was there a question on that? Okay. Okay, cool. Okay. Awesome. All right. Um, let's kind of stay within kind of credit. Let's talk a little bit about student loans. Um, for those of you that do have student loans, we do have to factor those into qualifying, whether it's a federal loan or a private loan. We all know that federal student loan debt is on forbearance right now as part of the CARES Act with the pandemic. That has been the case for the last couple of years. Um, now, however, if you're applying for a mortgage today, we still have to use a minimum payment in qualifying. Um, if you're on an IBR payment, income-based repayment amount, um, let's say it's like $75,000 in debt, um, we can take the IBR payment to use that for the qualifying. Now, if you're not on an IBR payment um, and you're applying for an FHA loan, the minimum payment that we'll use is 0.5% if you're not on the IBR payment for a conventional loan is 1%. Um, now, if you're on a monthly payment, IBR payment that's zero, that's the amount that we'll actually use. Um, so we'll follow that IBR payment. However, if, if your forbearance um, you know, doesn't have any payment due, you're either gonna have to sign up for an I, IBR payment um, or we're gonna have to use a default of 0.5% of the a balance or 1% for a conventional loan. Um, if you're back in school and now you're in deferment versus forbearance, we still have to use a minimum payment, okay? So that's, that's just kind of how the qualifying looks. Um, and we'll kind of go through some strategies around that with you as part of a consultation, but you know, the default is usually to use the IBR payment. If you're not in that, then we'll have to overlay one of these percentages of your balances. 
Okay. The other thing I just want to kind of point out here with student loans, because this comes up a little bit, if you're in a forbearance, not sorry, forbearance, but a forgivable situation, a lot of our clients that are in healthcare um, that are on uh, student loans that are have a forgiven uh, forgiveness uh, um, guideline to them, um, we still have to count a minimum payment, even though they're, they're they could potentially be forgivable. Now, I know um, there is potential legislation coming down uh, around student loan forgiveness. We'll have to see what that looks like. Hopefully it does come come to pass to, to have that opportunity for our buyers. But at least right now, we're going to have to currently count a minimum monthly payment for qualifying. Um, so let's look at, at some of the loan programs that you may consider for your first time home buying. Uh, and so there's generally five kind of core programs, conventional loans, FHA loans, VA loans. There's also USDA loans, and those are for some of our outlying areas. Uh, some of our desert cities would qualify under USDA. It's more of your uh, more of your rural areas, uh, and then jumbo loans. Um, now, jumbo loans are not as typical for our first time buyers because they usually have a larger down payment, anywhere between ten to twenty percent down payment. Um, with jumbo loans, they usually have a minimum credit score of six hundred and sixty or higher, um, and they do have a, a component for assets called reserves. Um, reserves are a percentage of your um, your minimum monthly payment. Um, so what what we generally look at is reserves is twelve months of your monthly payment that you would have in in assets that are whether it's a four hundred one k or four hundred three b or maybe in checking your savings account. In addition to what we have saved for our down payment and closing costs. So let's say I have a five thousand dollar monthly payment and my reserve requirement for a jumbo loan is twelve months of reserves. That means I need to have $60,000 in assets beyond my down payment and the funds for my closing costs. Okay, now jumbo loans don't come up often for our first time buyers, but certainly something we can talk about um, as we meet up with you for a consultation. Now, I wanna kind of spend some time looking at our conventional loans and our FHA loans. That's about 95% of our first time home buyers resources um, that are gonna be kind of used towards that. A conventional loan, which is gonna be a Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac loan is a minimum down payment of 3%. Um, up to a loan amount of 647,200. Now, once you go beyond 647,200 in loan amount, the minimum down payment jumps from 3% to 5%. So that's really important. So in high cost areas like LA or maybe Orange County, there's this space above 647,200 and 970,800, and that's called high balance loans. And they're designed to help high cost of living communities with a lesser down payment that would normally be required like on a jumbo loan of you know 10 to 20 percent and so it's a five percent minimum down payment once we go over a 647 200 loan amount now conventional loans have a minimum credit score of 620 as you learned a little bit earlier in our credit section so that's that's going to be an opportunity for our buyers that are using conventional financing um now for fha fha is a minimum down payment of three and a half percent and that three and a half percent carries over all the way up to a, a loan amount of 97800. Minimum credit score for an FHA loan is 580. Okay. Um, quick, quick question that came in through our chat here. So are individuals able to obtain loans for auctions and foreclosures or is it exclusively for standard home purchases? So financing for auction homes are a little bit different. Usually auction homes have to have someone available to provide guaranteed funds right there. So writing a check or, or cashier's check for the purchase of an auction home. But foreclosures are certainly allowed. Um, foreclosures are meaning that a bank or lending institution has taken back the property through the foreclosure process. And then the, the property is marketed to the general community. So you can absolutely use standard financing for that. Another thing that comes up is short sales. Um, short sales are um, properties that basically have been taken off at a loss, taken as a loss. So uh, ultimately, the the buyer, or sorry, I'm sorry, the seller is trying to sell their property at a discount for what they truly owe on the property. So let's say I owe five hundred thousand dollars on my mortgage, but um, I only can sell it for four hundred thousand. So you're asking the lender to take a hundred thousand um, dollar short of the balance. And honestly, that doesn't happen as much right now, um, especially because equity levels are still at all time highs for sellers. So we don't see a lot of foreclosures right now. Right now, We don't see a lot of short sales. Now, could that change? Possibly. Um, you know, I think if the housing market starts to shift a little bit, I don't think we're going to see anything like we saw in 2006, 2007, but or in 2008. But certainly, um, you know, if, if the market starts to shift a little bit, that could 
present, possess um, some inventory uh, that is around short sales and foreclosures. Um, now, when purchasing a home, we've got to take a look at PMI or private mortgage insurance, and that comes into play usually when we put less than 20% down. Um, as we, we heard earlier, you know, conventional loans and FHA loans are about 95% of what, you know, first-time buyers are going to utilize. Let's take a little closer look at conventional loans and how it relates to PMI or private mortgage insurance. So there is various options for PMI with a conventional loan. You can pay that monthly. You can split that up between monthly and upfront costs. You can pay a single premium. Um, and you can also do lender paid mortgage insurance. And that's where you raise up the cost of your interest rate or elect a higher interest rate to buy out your mortgage insurance. So let's say my rate is five and a half percent with a monthly mortgage insurance premium. But then maybe I want to take a higher interest rate because I really don't want to pay mortgage insurance monthly. So then I could elevate that, maybe that interest rate to 5.75 or maybe 6%, depending on your scenario. Now, mortgage insurance is based upon your credit score, how much you put down, and then how much you finance. So the higher my credit score is, the less I finance, the cheaper my uh, mortgage insurance could potentially be. Let me, um, I'm going to take a quick pause here really quick. We're having a little bit of a battery issue here. I just want to, I don't want to lose this here. So give me one second. Uh, okay. Oh, we're back. Yeah. We definitely don't want to lose power here with everybody on, on, online. Okay. So, um, so uh, mortgage insurance is based upon those three factors. Again, credit score, down payment, and loan amount. With a conventional loan, there is a potential cancellation option. So once I have two years in the home and 22% equity, I can potentially um, cancel the mortgage insurance. That's a really important point. And it's two components. So two years and 22% equity, okay? Um, now let's talk, well, actually, let me show you the example of a conventional PMI real quick before we go to FHA. So with conventional PMI, uh, let's just say we're financing 450 and our credit score is 700, uh, 740 and we're putting a minimum of 3% down. The mortgage insurance is about $183 a month, okay? So pretty reasonable. I will tell you some of the calculators that I, I, I get shared with me from uh, some of our clients on Redfin or Zillow, they're, they're much higher amounts. And the reason why is because they're, um, they're not built to um, utilize the differences between credit score and down payments and whatnot. They're kind of a one size fits all. So just something to keep in mind. Um, if you qualify for affordable housing products like low income housing programs, we're going to talk a little bit about some of those later on. In some cases, the mortgage insurance can be discounted by about 30%. Um, let's look at FHA loans, because um, FHA loans mortgage insurance is a little bit different. Um, so we know that you put down 3.5% for an FHA loan. The monthly mortgage insurance is calculated based upon 0.85% of the loan amount. So what we do is we take your amount financed, 0.85%, we times that, divided by 12, we come up with a mortgage insurance monthly premium. And then the upfront mortgage insurance premium gets added on to the top of the loan, which is 1.75% of the loan amount. Now with FHA loans, you cannot cancel the mortgage insurance. The only way to be able to cancel it is through a refinance. So let's look at the, the example of the, the, the mortgage insurance premium with a 450 FHA loan. So we still have the same loan amount. Now we have the monthly premium based upon the 0.85 at 324 per month. And then that upfront mortgage insurance of 78.75 gets added on to on top of the loan amount. Okay, so clearly the mortgage insurance is much more expensive from an FHA perspective. Um, and, you know, you may ask yourself, now, why would I choose FHA over conventional if the, if the costs look a lot more expensive? Well, FHA is going to be a little bit more lenient, first of all, from a credit score perspective, because as you saw earlier, it's a 580 minimum credit score. Some past challenges like late payments, collections, maybe you've had a bankruptcy, um, those things will be less of a time frame, uh, turnaround time with FHA loans than conventional loans. So let's say, for example, I had a bankruptcy that was three years ago. FHA would be absolutely okay with that, whereas conventional loans would want me to have a four-year seasoning period on something like that. Or let's say maybe I had a foreclosure uh, five years ago. Conventional loans would want a seven-year seasoning period, where FHA would have anywhere between a three to four-year seasoning period. So those differences, the leniency of FHA may choose us to go with FHA over a potential con uh, conventional product. Here's the uh, loan limits for conventional loans across some of our counties in Southern California. So you can see kind of LA, Orange are the same. And then we get into Riverside, San Bernardino uh, goes down quite a bit. And then Ventura and San Diego County. Now, 
Every year, these loan limits are updated right around November. We'll post the new loan limits and we'll also have them on our social channels and share with our clients. But usually right around November of every year, we'll see those no, new loan limits uh, posted. Okay, let's let's go ahead and uh, now that we've kind of learned a little bit about some of the credit requirements and loan programs, I want to spend some time looking at income documents um, and some some of the kind of the misconceptions we have around you know, current income and how that relates to qualifying for a mortgage. So for qualifying income, we're going to need to usually document the last two years of W-2s and or possibly tax returns, 30 days of pay stubs, and we're going to do some type of verification of employment, whether that's written and or verbal. And if I'm a self-employed client, it's going to require a little bit more documentation. Usually it's the last two years of taxes, some type of profit and loss statement, as well as a balance sheet. And then we got to verify the business through maybe a business license or a CPA letter. Um, so that takes a little bit more work for self-employed individuals. Now, let's talk a little more specifically about W-2 wage earners as it relates to time on the job or work history, because we get a lot of questions around, hey, I have to be on the job, or I've heard that I have to be on the job two years to be able to be eligible for a mortgage. So it's actually not the case. You can you just need to verify two years of work and or educational history. So we have a client right now purchasing a home. Uh, she's starting her new job on June 1st. Um, and so, but she's newly out of school, uh, completing her undergrad, but she went to undergrad in the field that she's gonna work in uh, on June 1st. So because she has four years of undergrad and now she's starting her new job June 1st, we have an executed offer letter that she's provided. We qualified her mortgage based upon that executed offer letter. And then she just starts on June 1st for a new job and that's satisfactory for the income requirement. So if the way the rule works, as long as you have two years um, in, in work and or education um, in, your, in your field of work, then that would qualify for the two-year requirement. Okay. A lot of questions we get, especially right now with maybe job history and maybe clients that are changing jobs because of the pandemic. Maybe they were unemployed uh, because of their company going out of business or whatever. Um, you can transition into a new job. There's no seasoning period required on the new job um, if it's full-time employment. If it's part-time employment, we do generally need to see two years of on, on the job. But if it's full-time, um, we can verify an hourly guaranteed wages and or base salary. That's all qualifiable right away. Another thing that comes up is, is dual employment. So if I have a full-time job, but plus I'm working like a part-time job, if you're working dual employment, so let's say I'm in the healthcare industry and I work 30 hours at one clinic, 30 hours at another, as long as I can show that I'm simultaneously working both jobs for the last two years, then um, I could be eligible to use both sources of income. Um, and then another thing that comes up is around clients that are have a full-time job, but then maybe they do Uber on the side or Lyft, and they want to count their self-employment income. So if we're going to do that, we do have to show two years of history um, of the self-employment income to use that for eligibility. Okay. All right. If you have any questions or scenarios on income, feel free to use the uh, Q&A function in Zoom, and we can kind of talk through some different scenarios as a group here. There's a, there's a calculation we use um, for qualifying for a mortgage and it's called debt to income ratio. It takes into consideration your pre-tax income versus your monthly obligations. If you're self-employed, instead of using pre-tax, we're gonna use your net operating income. Let's say if you're a sole proprietor. Um, so how that calculation looks is I take my pre-tax income versus all of my monthly obligations that will appear on my credit report, including the new housing payment. Usually we don't want that debt to income ratio to be more than 43 to 45% of my pre-tax income, okay? Now, in consulting with clients, debt to income ratio is a great way of looking at qualifying, but it's not necessarily measuring affordability. So that's why we're gonna kind of talk more through about your budget, you know, see what a certain payment feels like. And if it's something that's, you know, reasonable for you to create, you know, sustainable home ownership, we wanna make sure that, that the budget we design is gonna be something that's gonna be suitable for you going forward. Debt to income ratio is calculated like this. So it's principal and interest, the property taxes on my house, homeowners insurance, PMI if applicable, homeowners and uh, HOA or homeowners association dues if applicable. That's going to be for like condos, townhouses, um, things of that nature. Some some homes will have HOA dues, but more so it's going to be reserved for our condos and townhouses. So let's say my total housing budget was twenty five hundred per month, 
And then I had other debts of like $500 a month. If I was to take that $3,000 in expected obligations versus my monthly gross income of $8,500 a month, that would calculate out my debt to income ratio at about 35.29%. Most of our first time clients, uh, first time buyer clients feel comfortable around a 33 to 36% debt to income ratio. As, as, as we kind of have consultations with our clients, you know, that number is uh, something that's that, that changes for, for each client. But as a rule of thumb, most clients feel pretty good around that 33 to 36% debt to income ratio. All right, so now we've kind of talked a little bit about income. Now I wanna focus our attention on assets um, for our down payment. And generally speaking, depending on your purchase price, most clients are gonna to have to save anywhere between 20 to $25,000 um, for their home purchase, depending on what programs we can utilize, whether it's down payment assistance programs. And you know, when I, when I meet with clients throughout the, throughout the year, you know, there's usually two things that are kind of like roadblocks or challenges. It's usually credit, or it's just lack of resources for down payment. Now, credit, we can talk through, we can build game plans for. Assets, um, depending on what position they're in, it, it really depends on how we can best support them. But assistance programs, which you're gonna learn a little bit more about in just a bit, are a great tool to help you, you know, overcome maybe some of those obstacles around assets. Now, we do have to verify um, the assets used for a home purchase. Usually it's gonna be through a checking and savings account. We have to make sure we see the last 60 days of that asset being in your account. So we can't use any large deposits or we have to at least explain large deposits and know where they originate from. Um, but cash can't be used in a home purchase. Um, retirement accounts, 401ks, 403bs, even IRAs can be used. But I will say that, you know, for IRAs, talk with your tax advisor, maybe your financial advisor, make sure you don't create a tax event for yourself. And then gift funds are, are where a family member will help you out with some of the funds needed to purchase your home. That's, that's you know, pretty frequent for our first time home buyers. There is no seasoning requirement with gift funds. So most assets need to be seasoned 60 days, whereas gift funds can be eligible for the financing right away. All right, so let's look at um, the assistance program. And we've had a lot of talk around the assistance program because um, for those of you that maybe checked out uh, ABC Channel 7 News um, in Southern California, there's a great um, piece on some of the assistance programs offered through CalHFA. We're very fortunate to be one of the largest partners and the uh, number one provider of the CalHFA program across the state. Um, and CalHFA is the California Housing Finance Agency, and it's designed to help low to moderate income households. Um, the two core products that we've offered over the last several years is the My Home Assistance and the Zip Assistance Program. The My Home Program is designed to help you with your down payment, which can be anywhere between three to three and a half percent of the sales price and assistance. It's a low interest loan at 1%, um, and it's completely deferred until you either sell the home or if you refinance in the future. So it's a great resource for you. So if you think about the minimum down payment for a conventional loan being 3%, this would fill the void for a buyer of covering that amount for them. Um, and then as we've learned earlier, not only is there down payment, but there's closing costs. And the ZIP assistance program can be a resource for you there as well, because that can provide up to two to 3% of your sales price and assistance. And it's interest-free, also not requiring any payment until you sell or refinance in the future. Now you do have to elect the My Home program first. And if you still need some additional support, then we can add on the ZIP assistance, okay? Um, now that's the two kind of core programs with CalHFA. And again, CalHFA is designed to help low to moderate income, uh, first time home buyers. There is some income limits with the program, uh, for CalHFA, my home and zip. You're going to learn about another program in just a few minutes, but these are the income limits for the program. Most programs will require you to be at 80% or less of the median income. Whereas the CalHFA, my home and zip program, as you can see here, is pretty lenient from an income perspective. As we can see, 158 in, uh, in LA and 211 in Orange. So you can see all our different Southern California counties. Uh, next month, uh, sorry, next week or next month um, on Wednesday, the new income limits will be announced for Cal HFA. So um, we'll get a chance to see what those new uh, limits look like. LA County um, is, you know, unfortunately one of our lower counties just because it's such a large county. So I'm hoping we're going to see a little bit of an uptick in the income limits for LA County so we can help more clients in that in that respective market. But this is what it looks like in, in the Southern California counties. Um, if you were to utilize the Cal HFA conventional loan, uh, and let's say we wanted to purchase at a $500,000 purchase price. Well, first of all, on a standard uh, 
financing structure, 3% down would be $15,000. Plus with our closing costs, we'll probably need twenty-five dollars to $30,000 out of pocket to buy at $500,000. But with CalHFA assistance, we could get that 3% My Home Assistance in place to be able to help offset the down payment. So instead of having to bring both the down payment and closing costs to qualifying, uh, maybe it's just the closing costs. Or if we still need some additional help with closing costs, we could add the zip assistance of two to 3% of our uh, loan amount for additional help. So instead of having to save up for 25 to 30,000, maybe we're spent saying, you know, saving up maybe four to $6,000 for our home purchase, with, which might be a little bit more reasonable for us is first time buyers. Um, there's an FHA version of Cal HFA, so it'll do the exact same thing. So as we learned earlier, the minimum down payment is three and a half percent for FHA, 3% for conventional. So that's where we see the difference here with FHA. It's the my home would now elevate to three and a half percent to match the FHA minimum down payment. And you also have the same two to three percent available through the zip assistance program. Now, the program that just launched about four weeks ago, and I think that's what's got a lot of the attention on some of the news outlets, is the Forgivable Equity Builder Loan. So many of you might be even joining tonight's workshop because you've heard about this program. Um, we were very fortunate to be one of the first um, funders of the Forgivable Equity Program. We got, got a chance to help a client in uh, the desert communities about three weeks ago utilize this program. And what's really cool about it, 3% um, or 3.5% is great through my home, but this provides up to 10% of your purchase price or appraised value, whichever is less, in for fully forgiven assistance as long as you stay in the home for five years. Now, it's a bit more restrictive from an income perspective because you have to make less than 80% of the median income to qualify for this. So as you can see here in LA, it's less than $68,880. Um, hopefully, we'll see some changes from an income perspective on this program next month so we can hopefully help more, more of our communities with this. Um, it is a freestanding product, so we would help with the first mortgage as well as the forgivable equity program, but we can't combine this with the My Home and the Zip program. Um, now, this does require a minimum credit score of 640 for the program. Um, that's on an FHA loan. It's 660 for a conventional loan through the program. Um, all of Cal HFA programs, whether it's the My Home and Zip or the Forgivable Equity Program, it's a minimum score of 640. Um, now, there is debt to income ratio requirements. Um, so 45% is the maximum for the program. Um, this is a big one here is the income qualifications. They're, now, they're based on the applicant's income only, not the household size. And we're getting a lot of questions about this, especially on the equity builder program. So if I have three sources of income in the household and only one of those sources applies for the mortgage, that's the income we can use for qualifying under the program. But then that income needs to be able to support whatever you know sales price our clients are looking to purchase at. Um, if you're married, uh, you don't have to apply together. Um, some cases will have just the one spouse um, uh, apply and the other other uh, partner does not have to be a part of the application. That's one way of potentially staying below the income limits. This is designed to help first-time home buyers. So a first-time home buyer is someone that hasn't owned in the last three years. So you could have owned back in 2010, subsequently sold that house and now be considered uh, a first-time buyer since you haven't owned in the last three years. Uh, this is for single family homes, new construction, condos, townhouses, uh, even some of your below market homes that are available in the communities, um, those are all eligible for Cal HFA. The one, the one thing that doesn't really work is like 203K loans. I think we had a question that came in like that. We can't use those on these type of programs. Uh, manufactured homes can be potentially eligible, but it has to be on land that is owned. So it can't be like in a park where you're paying a lease space. It has to be like on actual land that's owned. Um, so those are just some, some things that you want to keep in mind with the program. But Cal HFA is just a wonderful resource that we get a chance to bring to our communities as being the leading provider of the program. And so those are things that we can look at as part of a, a consultation with you. Um, here's what the buying process looks like. And I think this is pretty helpful for our first time home buyers to understand, like, where do I go from here once I have, say, a pre-approval? And by the way, the pre-approval is going to be the output of a consultation with a, um, with a, our team. So a pre-approval allows you to um, be able to start going out and looking at homes because now you have a certificate that you're financing this place. So this slide here is our six steps of home buying. We're gonna take you through pre-approval all the way up to closing your, your loan and what that looks like. Um, as I mentioned earlier, pre-approval is a certificate and that allows you to present that certificate to a seller to say that your financing is completely in place. 
Um, a pre-approval is good for about 60 days. We can always recertify at any time. You don't have to reapply for financing. When we start your pre-approval process, which you'll learn about how that begins, but ultimately we only pull a soft credit score for you. We don't pull a hard inquiry. So it allows you to be able to look at your options and not have to worry about maybe your credit being impacted. Um, so the pre-approval will be that certificate that allows us to launch into home buying and home buying is step two or house hunting. Um, we really encourage you to work with a realtor um, during that process. You can you know, work with one of our preferred realtors that we have across the, the state, or you can certainly find someone on your own. You, um, but ultimately having that resource just allows you to have a more effective home search, negotiating power, and ultimately someone that uh, on top of us to be able to support um, you in that, in that home buying journey. Um, as you go out and look at homes, we can uh, update your pre-approval to match whatever it is your offer price. So if you get pre-approved for $500,000, for example, and you fall in love with the house for $425,000, we can easily update that pre-approval for you. So that's the house hunting phase. Now let's say we move forward, we find a house, we wanna make an offer on a house and the seller actually accepts our offer. That means we're gonna move into the enter escrow phase. That's called step three of the process. So a seller has accepted our offer, Within two to three days of that acceptance, we're going to be required to make an earnest money deposit. That deposit is anywhere between one to two percent of our purchase price. Now, that deposit goes towards your total out of pocket expense and it's held in escrow while you go through the escrow phase. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. Um, our team will reach out to you within 24 hours of your acceptance to kind of talk about next steps in the process and schedule you for your follow up consultation. And, um, and that follow-up consultation will allow us to kind of design the financing options with you, go over interest rates, payments, um, your out-of-pocket expense, if you've elected the assistance programs, what you'll need to do in place to have that and for us to get you registered with the state. Um, and then your realtor will orchestrate ordering inspections, we'll order your appraisal, and at the wrap of that follow-up consultation, we'll get your uh, initial disclosures delivered to you for your home purchase. Okay, so that'll start us off in the process. Let's talk about what earnest money deposit looks like. So again, it's gonna be anywhere between one to 2% of your purchase price. That money is protected in escrow. So the seller doesn't get access to that because you as a buyer have your opportunity to do your due diligence or your homework on the property. And that's called the contingencies. The contingencies usually include an appraisal of the property being done and that will administer that as the lender. Your realtor will order the appraisal or sorry, the inspections of the property and then we'll get your loan approved. Usually the contingency is in the first 14 to 17 days of your contract period. And um, you know that uh, earnest money deposit is protected while you're in escrow. Um, so if for some reason, you know the inspections turn up some faulty wiring or dry rod that you're just not comfortable with in the property, you could potentially cancel the transaction and get a full refund of your deposit. Now, we do realize that as part of the negotiations, contingencies and the timelines can be um, something that's negotiated. Um, I would really encourage our clients to talk to their realtors because um, that timeline of the contingencies, as well as you know whether you have a contingency in place, will be you know kind of a strategic decision for you. Usually, the contingency period is the first 14 to 17 days of your contract, so it's within you know, really from step three up to milestone step five. Next stage in the process is processing and underwriting. That's where our team is doing some of the administrative tasks on your loan. Not only have we ordered the appraisal, but we're verifying your income, your assets. We're getting all your product design so we can effectively get through the underwriting process. Your loan has been locked in more than likely for your interest rate. Uh, and like we said earlier, your disclosures have been sent to you. And so everything is getting prepared to go to our underwriting team. And that takes us to step five when they've issued the loan approval. And by that time, we're about three weeks through the process, I would imagine. Um, we're probably at the end of your contingency period. So if you do feel comfortable with the outcome of your inspection reports, your appraisal, your loans approved, then you could potentially cancel, I'm sorry, sorry cancel, but can um, release your contingency on, on the property. But you wanna be careful because if for some reason, a couple of days later after maybe signing off on that contingency, you just don't feel comfortable with the property you want to cancel, then you could potentially risk your deposit. So you really want to be careful with that. Um, at step five, we're going to issue to you a final closing disclosure. That's going to give you a three-day cooling off period before we get to the very final stage of step six. And the closing disclosure allows you to just compare your interest rate with previous disclosures, as well as the out-of-pocket expense to make sure you have a full understanding of your, your loan terms and conditions. 
And then finally, step six is closing your loan. So that's where we're going to get a chance to sign final documents in person with a public notary. That takes about an hour or so to go through that process. Um, if you have any additional funds that are still owed um, and it's part of the escrow process, you'll make that final deposit at that time. The escrow team will then deliver back the documents to us through electronic upload. We'll do a final audit of everything in the lending process. If everything looks great, then we'll wire in the funds for the first mortgage. And if you've elected any assistance programs, we'll wire in the funds for that as well. Those monies get reconciled to ensure you as a buyer have contributed all the funds you're supposed to. And if everything balances out and the seller's receiving the proceeds that they're expecting, then the escrow team will record documents with the county recorder's office. They're generally going to record a grant deed, and that transfers ownership from the seller to you. They'll also record a deed of trust, which is your agreement to repay the loan. And so once all the recording uh, documents are confirmed, then you will become the official owner of the property. Okay, so that's that's what that process will look like. And, and obviously a huge event um, and uh, something we want to celebrate once we get to that step six in the process, along with you and your realtor, because you made it through that journey towards homeownership. You know, um, this is probably going to be one of the largest investments you make in your lifetime. Um, you know, obviously, all of you guys that are joining tonight's workshop, um, you're, you're taking and doing your kind of a homework to make sure that you're fully prepared to take on this large, uh, you know, financial uh, investment for yourselves. And, you know, taking that time and, and kind of preparing yourself is what we do through a consultation. You've heard me talk about it a few times. That allows us to do a 30 to 45 minute session with you to develop a home buying game plan. Um, before we kind of develop that plan, you would submit an online application, you would upload proof of your income and assets, and then we would meet up for either a video or phone consultation. I think that's a really great way of kind of launching into the home buying journey. Um, and, you know, we get a chance to meet with clients through all throughout the day, kind of designing those plans. Um, if you do have like some, maybe some follow-up questions, or you want to kind of just go through some personal scenarios after today's workshop, um, we can do an intro call and you can schedule either the intro call or even a consultation using our, our scheduling appointment link here. Uh, that's a, just a great way for us to be able to connect with you after today's workshop. Um, here's what a consultation looks like. So it's kind of, this is kind of the framework of, of a consultation. So you've heard me talk about it earlier, but we're going to do kind of a rent versus buying analysis. So we'll kind of talk about where you're at from a housing perspective, what you want it to look like going forward with home buying. Um, we'll look at some budgeting, different locations that we're looking to buy in, talk about interest rates, closing costs, debt to income ratio. We'll walk you through the six steps of home buying. And then, like I said earlier, the output of that consultation is to issue a pre-approval for you. And that allows you to take those next steps to home shopping at step two. So really a great way to start that home uh, home ownership journey, if you will, is just to have that comprehensive plan, plan, which will come out of that consultation for you. Now, we have some really great resources available to you, including our mobile app. Um, you can start the application process right through mobile. It works for Android or iPhone. You can follow the, the progress of your application upload documents. You can do the calculations through our mobile app. So I really encourage you to check out that tool. It's a, it's a great resource that we have available to our clients. Um, now, you're, like I said earlier, you probably heard about today's workshop through our USC partnership, but we have all partnerships all across California, and we pass along a very similar discount of $750 in closing costs uh, reduction, which takes our processing fee, like I said, from $910 down to $160 for our, our various partnerships. Even if you're a state employee, um, we have the same uh, discount available to you as well. So for friends, family, coworkers um, that may be a part of those communities and they elect us um, for their uh, home buying partner, um, home financing partner, they'll definitely be able to take advantage of that discount. Um, and you know, this, like I've said a couple of times tonight, this is probably gonna be the largest investment of your lifetime. So we wanna be that trusted mortgage advisor for you um, along with some of our real estate partners. So we really wanna be that, that educational partner to help guide you through the home buying process. Um, so speaking of education, we have more classes coming up. Um, obviously you're joining tonight's class, but we have another class in, in June um, and then we'll kind of get into our regular schedule program. Um, if you have friends, family, coworkers that want to attend one of these classes, it's free to the public. Uh, they can visit mortgageeducate.com for some of our upcoming classes. We would love to be able to see more, uh, more of our uh, clients come into the, some of the workshops. Um, this, is some of, this is my contact information. So if you want to message me after tonight's uh, session, uh, you can send me a, a text, call, an email, whatever's good for you. And then, of course, you can schedule either your intro call or consultation with this link here. And, you know, we love to celebrate homeownership. Um, you know, I, 
there's no bit better joy in my day when I get a chance to call a client that's just received the keys to their house and, uh, and get a chance to celebrate with them. And uh, there's so many of those great testimonies that we have on our social channels. I'd really encourage you to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, um, check out some of our reviews on Google and Yelp. We're really proud of what our clients are saying about us. Okay. All right. Well, I, I, that's going to bring us to the end of, of tonight's presentation. You know, I really appreciate everyone joining us this evening. Um, we're going to stay uh, on air to answer any questions that you might have as we've gone through tonight's content. Um, we would have as many questions as we usually get through the evening, but um, I certainly want to keep us live here so we can go through questions over the next few minutes. So I'm going to go ahead and just uh, go to mute. And then um, what we'll do is we'll wrap up tonight's discussion after I've kind of addressed any questions that have come in. Okay, we'll be right back.